What is gender? What do we see as a truly masculine and what is truly feminine? We have pretty rigid ideas about masculinity and femininity, and few people realize that there is something in between. And I remember only too well how at school I always tried to talk a little lower, a little rougher, to sound more masculine, to hide that I'm gay and so on. And we have exactly the same rigid ideas about opera and especially about baroque opera, which is considered to be the most complex, highly intellectual and elite form of art. So both misconceptions about gender and about opera have been destroyed by the person we are going to visit now. It is Anthony Ross Costanza, an opera singer who sings as a countertenor, the highest male register. He sings higher than many women do. And with him we will talk about what opera is, what it means to be a real man, woman or something in between, completely different, somewhere in the infinity between the male and female poles. Let's go! Be ready for stupid questions, because I don't know anything about classic music. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if, um, how exactly you found out that you are a countertenor, and is it something that is natural as, um, I don't know, color of your eyes and your hate, or is it um, can be like developed? So a it's a little bit of both. Um, there's a little nature and there's a little nurture. But when I was a young kid, I took piano lessons and my piano teacher said, maybe you want to try singing. And so when I was about eight years old, I sang and like all boys had a very high voice, sort of boy soprano voice. And um, I wound up going from theaters in my town where I grew up in North Carolina to Broadway when I was 11. I told my parents I wanted to be on Broadway and I came to New York and um, so at 11. at 11, yes, How I was come? very ambitious. Well, I wanted to, I felt I'd done 10 shows locally in North Carolina and I wanted to try and do, um, the best, the highest level possible. So I said, let me come to New York and try on Broadway. And, uh, I did. And, um, it worked. I got performances and I sang as a boy soprano there. And then when I was about 13 years old, someone asked me to be in an opera and I, I didn't know anything about opera. But um, I went and I auditioned and I got into this opera and it was a very complicated story um, based on Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, which is a very psychologically complex tale about sexual abuse and childhood and psychology and all of that. Wow. And uh, I found it so fascinating that in opera I could really express these deep emotions more powerfully. Um, and so uh, I sang this role and I had a great time, but uh, somebody said, maybe you're a countertenor because it looks like, you know, you have hair on your arm, maybe your voice has changed already and you're just singing high. And I didn't know what a countertenor was, uh, but I looked it up and it meant I could keep singing high. The and steps of the, how exactly hair on your arms? Uh... Because I'd gone through puberty, basically. Yeah, and they said you are a countertenor because of well, so if you go through puberty, but you still are singing in this high range, then you're not a boy soprano anymore. You're a countertenor. Uh-huh. I see. Yeah. And uh, so I, I thought I didn't think much of continuing to sing high and what that meant in terms of gender, sexuality or anything like that. And my parents were both psychologists, so they were both very supportive um, and didn't, didn't make me self-conscious about continuing to sing high. Uh, so I began to study how to be a countertenor, and and um, that's how I that's how it started. Did you ever try to sing lower than? I've tried and I've done it, and I can. Uh, the thing about the male voice, actually, as to your question about whether it's natural, is that every male, every human being, actually has both a chest voice and a head voice. So the chest voice is the range we all speak in, but right. the head voice is the higher register. For men, it's called falsetto, and yes. all pop singers sing in it now. You know, Justin Timberlake, Justin Bieber, Michael Jackson, all those people use the falsetto. Um, but uh, this, what I'm doing is taking that falsetto register 
and developing it a little more. So I have to work on that. I have to, over the years, I've had to figure out how to do that technically and physiologically. When I sing at the Met, it's a house of 4,000 seats and there are no microphones. So it's all natural sound. So even though I'm singing in this weaker, high male register, I have to make it fill a big opera house. How exactly the, the volume range is um, connected to your gender or to your sexuality, maybe? Well, I think the pitch, what you're talking about, how high we sing, in today's world, we really think a lot about pitch as associated with gender. So the lower someone sings, the more masculine, in some conventional sense, we think it is. Oh, yeah. And the higher someone speaks or sings, the more feminine. Um, and that's especially true with men, I think, um, but also to a certain extent with women. If a woman has a very low voice, we may say she's more masculine. Yes. What's really interesting, though, is um, so I'll talk about a few different things. Physiologically, when you sing, what's happening is in your throat, your vocal cords, which are two pieces of skin, come together and you send air between them and they vibrate. And that vibration sounds like a little buzz, a little kazoo, nothing special, and it travels up and it makes sound in your head. Um, and that sound that it takes on from bouncing off of the bone structure in your face and the shapes inside your mouth, um, that's what creates right. the sound we hear. And so it's really the face, it's, it's the physiology and the face that creates sound, which is very interesting and makes it very personal. Um, but when we sing as a countertenor, Instead of bringing the vocal cords all the way together, we bring only a little bit of them together. And the reason for that is the shorter the string, the higher the pitch, just like on a piano or when you take a rubber band and you pluck a shorter part of it, it's uh, higher. So uh, there's a gap and that's where air can escape. And we don't want air in the sound because then it sounds airy. But if I were to ask you to speak in falsetto, it might sound airy because you're not practiced at trying to minimize the escaping air through that side. And I basically just practice how to make it sound really uh, not airy at all. So, so what's the difference between airy and not airy? Well, when I do like this, it's yeah, like airy. you have air. And, and if I go like, like You know, or something like that. It has more <laughs> core. So, uh, wow. yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's a it's a stronger. So you are 11 years old. I can recall like my adolescence, and everybody, including me, especially like gay um, teenagers, they are trying to speak lower to be more masculine, so that nobody knows they are gay. Mm -hmm. Uh, was it an issue for you? It, it never was, I think, because of my parents. Although I was aware of the fact that there, people ascribed a kind of feminine sound to this way that I sang. So you never was shy of singing uh, with a female voice? No, because it was empowering to me. And, wow. Uh, it also was my success, right? You know, I, I was unique from other people because of this thing that I had. But children in your class, did they ever f make fun of you? Sometimes, although... It's uh, like North Carolina, it's not the Manhattan Yes, thing. it's very true. And when I went back to high school in North Carolina after a couple of years in New York, there were people who made fun of me, but also I had a way of engaging them in what I did somehow. What uh, is that way? Uh, I well, <laughs> I guess um, to be very sort of honest and not ashamed in any way of it and trying to get them interested in it because at the end of the day it's a novelty always to have a male sing in what we hear as a female register so if people laugh at it and you laugh with them and you invite them to laugh at it really then they can't make fun of you as much you know what i mean and um still today i go and work with kids. There's a video of me working with kids in the Bronx. Yeah, I saw the, the, yeah. the video. And when I start to sing, they all laugh, uh, you know, but I don't in any way to say, you know, make them feel bad for it. I want them to laugh. I want them to enjoy it because it's a natural reaction. And once that happens, it kind of disarms uh, 
anyone because they're in no way sort of wounding you. You're taking part in the same experience and you're acknowledging that it's strange, you know, that this man is singing in this high register. So you came to uh, Broadway when you were 11 and then you came back in a couple of years, like when you were 13 or something, Yeah. Uh, to North Carolina. Yeah. You were absent for two years, then came back to your school, to your class. Yeah. And they accepted you uh, at the very moment you came back or was there, there were, any there tension? Were, no, there were definitely tensions and I didn't feel the same as everyone else, in part because I was small and skinny and wearing all black and they were, you know, wearing khaki shorts and white sneakers and it was a different culture in America. So that took some adjustment, but um, I always sort of found my way to uh, people I could befriend and ways to, inroads to make relationships with people. Um, when That's I was a something that fascinates me. You never were shy of yourself or of your a female vo voice, no. especially when you're like teenager and you're so fragile. Uh, yeah, I don't, I never had, I think in part because my parents as two psychologists, not only were they supportive, but they knew how to help me form a, a psychology that was, um, you know, useful in terms of combating any, any embarrassment, any shyness. Wherever you are, I don't think that kids naturally um, judge things. I think it's from uh, oh, the people <laughs> around them. I mean, I know, I know that they, they do, but once you get past the preconceptions that they have at uh -huh. a certain age, there are ways to, to change it and to, uh, to shape it, basically. Were there any uh, cases, uh, no, not with you, but in general, in your school of any kind of bullying or something? Like yes, that? I remember one teacher, like the math teacher was gay and uh, they poured chocolate milk on his car and things like that. But kids, the kids. Wow. I remember certain things and I wasn't at the time, I didn't identify as gay, you know, I, I, I didn't, I, you know, I was 13 or 14 and I didn't really think about it that much. And I, I remember when I was maybe 15 or so, I said to my parents, if I'm attracted to men, does that mean I'm gay? And my parents in their classical way said, it could, it's possible, I don't, you'll find out, you know. Um, so even that, it wasn't encouraged to define my sexuality or even have a moment where I came out right. um, versus, you know, I, I just was who I was, which is, a, I realize, an unusual way to be as a teenager. When exactly did you figure out that you are attracted to a man? In my teenage years, I'm sure I must have, uh, like I would go to the gym at one point and you change in a locker room with guys and you, you know, that's where you see things. It was nightmare things. in really? <laughs> school time. <laughs> I, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so that's where it began, but I still dated women and, and girls up till I was 18 or something. And then I went to do a ballet uh, where I sang in this ballet that toured all through Italy and Greece. And there were eight dancers, four men and four women. And um, I thought to myself, okay, I'm in Europe by myself for the first time, um, no parents or something. I, I really want to, you know, lose my virginity or, you know, have an experience or a relationship or something. So I thought, well, one of these, one of these eight dancers, either one of some of the four men or the four women, one of them should be it because we'll be together for two months. And, you know, they're all beautiful people. And um, so you, you didn't even know if you will pick a guy or girl. From no, I hadn't. Team. I mean, and this wasn't all incredibly conscious. It was somewhat subconscious <laughs> that I, uh, you know, and in retrospect, I think that's how I felt. But um, there was one beautiful male dancer who I was particularly attracted to. And I would think about, you know, if something happened with him and he lived a little bit farther away in Italy from where we were rehearsing and he missed his train one day. We all were having dinner and um, asked if he could stay. And I said, yes, and that's how that all began. But I remember the first night he came, stayed with me and he spoke no English and I really didn't speak Italian at the time. 
two weeks after I met him, I spoke fluent Italian. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I remember that we, we kissed and, and we didn't do very much. It was very gentle. He was a little bit older than me. Um, but I was so nervous about it that I went around the corner and I called my mother from Italy and I said, mom, you know, I just kissed a guy. And um, I think the first thing that she said was, well, if you're gonna have oral sex, you should use a condom. And I said, I don't think anyone does that. And she said, well, then just be careful, make good decisions. Um, so that- Which means what, I wonder. You know, uh, have a good time, but you know, try and use good judgment. So uh, I, you know, that's, that was the kind, those, that's how my parents were. And that's in part, I think, why I didn't really have any issues with it. If you want to hear the, the funny story, I was in, in this ballet dressed in a sort of torn t-shirt that was put back together with safety pins and a brocade Baroque jacket and hair that was spray painted pink. It was almost kind of punk rock. And he was very classically, uh, you know, ballet with, um, you know, point shoes and all this stuff. And we performed the first performance in Sicily in an old, old 2000 year old Roman theater in Taormina yes. that was like ruins and the back wall had fallen down. And as you looked by the back wall, you could see the volcano Etna and it erupted just a tiny bit, you know, a little bit of red lava. And at this point, we'd been together, I don't know, maybe three weeks, and we performed. We were in the same hotel room, and it had a balcony that looked onto the sea and the volcano. And um, that's where, for the first time, anyone told me they loved me, and he told me in Italian. So that was my first experience in front of an exploding volcano. It's the most uh, beautiful experience you can imagine. It was lucky. It was, it was lucky. very lucky. Well, now I would say I'm gay, yes. And although recently there's this new word queer, which in America, you know, is like a, a term which encompasses everything. And I come from a generation where I think of myself as gay. Mm -hmm. um, but if I were growing up today, maybe I would feel queer. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really know enough about how to define. Yeah, but it's too broad. And if you try to specify your... Uh, personal um, sexual uh, sexuality. What of all queerness is your part? I would say I'm gay. I mean, and and, and I've only really had sex with men in terms I of. Uh, I mean, other than in high school, some some uh, some experimentation with women. I saw in your previous interviews you speak a lot of yeah. these times when it's not like binary. It is more liquid. What exactly do you mean? Do you mean by liquid gender? What, well, I guess um, gender fluid is a kind of. Uh, I know I have a friend, for example, Justin Vivian Bond, a wonderful performer and cabaret artist, and they don't say that they're transsexual, meaning that they have changed sexes, like or a surgery, rather just trans, meaning that they are between man and woman which I think is interesting that it, they exist outside of some binary conception of what gender is. And you see that increasingly in today's world and with young people, that there are people who are non-binary. Like, uh, explain it, how exactly they look or what, biologically they stay as they were born, right? Well, Those Justin Vivian Bond, who I know um, biologically still has male genitals, but also has taken estrogen, female hormones, and so has uh, breasts and looks a lot like a woman, but has a very, very low speaking voice and singing voice. And this is exactly the point uh, where uh, they feel themselves. Yes. So Absolutely. N uh, neither female nor male. Exactly. Exactly. And okay. it's I had trouble wrapping my head around that really until I had this person in my life. And I, I they're a performer so I went to see them perform with some friends who said you should come. And I thought, "Oh, am I going to am I going to understand am I going to relate to it? Am I going to understand what's going on or what I'm looking at? You know, you have that in the back of your mind. And the minute this person came on stage, you've, I forgot 
entirely because they were real. They were very powerful in their ability to be themselves and to perform. But what I wanted to talk about in terms of the way that fluidity of gender relates to my voice as a countertenor is the reason countertenors exist in part is to sing repertoire that was written in Baroque times. And when opera began, it began in Italy in 1600. And very soon after it begins, these fascinating and horrific creatures called the castrati appear. And um, they become the reason opera is made popular, which is to say not an art form of the nobility, but an art form for everyone. And there, if you think about a time when women are not allowed to sing in church. And so the only high sound we get is young boys. And as music is expanding from the Renaissance to more complicated, more polyphonous, more tones, you need to have voices that can be strong and high. I think this is why the castrati appear. And what castrati were, men whose balls, whose testicles were crushed usually, not so much cut off because that could lead to bleeding and all kinds of things. So they were generally crushed before they went through puberty so that they could maintain these high voices and they wouldn't go through certain hormonal changes that change their voice. Right. But they grew as adults, their bodies grew, and they just maintained these high voices. So they had an instrument, the body, which was adult and therefore a sound that was loud, but this high tone. And that became so fascinating and so popular that all the great composers, I mean, Mozart and Gluck and Handel and Vivaldi and Bach, all were writing for these castrated men. Now, what that meant is that they became the highest paid, most famous rock stars of their era. And if you think about it, the consequence of that was when you had um, a leading role like Julius Caesar, the great war general, if we were putting uh, making an opera today and said, well, this is, a, you know, he's a great warrior, you'd think, oh, we must have a low voice. But in those times, in the Baroque times, when they said, okay, we're writing an opera for the great Julius Caesar, you wanted the castrato, you wanted a high voice. So their conception of masculinity yes. and gender was very, very different and in a way much more advanced, but because of this terrible thing of castration. Um, and so, uh, and the, the other thing I'll say is that there were so many men and women who found the castrati very sexually uh, interesting or attractive. Now, part of it might have been a fantasy because the castrati apparently, according to some doctor's reports from the time, could have sex and could even ejaculate, but were not fertile because they had no functioning testicles. Yeah, but it's usually about castrati who um, went through this operation uh, later, like when they were older, no, no, boys no. about like even, 13. Even the boys who were did it at 10, 11, they, they were still, according to the doctor's reports, able to have sex. But I think the idea for some women in a time when there was no birth control that you had these safe lovers. It's like a sexual revolution of 1968. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, that is part of that, whether it was carried out or just imagined, caused women to faint, according to all the reports, when the castrato would sing a note of an, in a particular way. And it's exactly like what happened with Michael Jackson when you look at his concerts and he would hit these high notes and you see in the videos of his concerts, women faint. It's, a, it's the exact same kind of thing that happened with all of these from American you know, singers and I'm sure also in other countries, but you know, the Bee Gees and Michael Jackson and Prince and all of these people who sang really high and who still do all of these male singers who sing in the falsetto, that, in a way, it doesn't make them more effeminate. If you look at Prince, we don't know, you know, he wasn't, I don't think gay. I think he had sex with women. He might have been considered queer in today's world, but uh, he was really attractive to women. Of course. In a sexual and way. And David Bowie. And, and David Bowie and all of that. 
So I think the relationship between pitch and gender is a complicated one. We all think we have one conception of it, but in fact, it has a lot of different layers because of its history and because of popular culture. How you personally identify your gender? Is it like 100% male or something? I would say 100% male, yeah. I mean, I have never, um, I'm not worried about appearing in a feminine or effeminate in any way, um, but I do feel, yeah, male. Right. Let's uh, talk about your creative work because it's pretty unusual. Besides of doing uh, opera, you also uh, do like a lot of things. You just released an um, album uh, mm -hmm. last year and that uh, stage show. Yeah. And also you do a lot of video, uh, music videos. So it's like totally 100% classical um, content being put in a sort of very modern uh, formats. Yeah. So you're like a pop star <laughs> of a classic music. Well, thank you. I'm trying to really expand the audience for classical music, and I think it's important. Um, and how do we do that? That's the question that everyone is asking. Because classical music in itself, I don't think it has to alienate people um, you know if if when I uh, when I find uh, someone on the street on grinder wherever I find them and I say hey do let's you, go to the opera or do you have grinder I do yeah really yeah 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 <laughs> wow um, okay good and and I like to meet people in any way possible and I think everything is like a grassroots opportunity to convert people to classical music and to like it. So I'm constantly trying to understand what makes people relate to music when I'm working with kids, when I'm working with people who have no experience. So when I, um, when I sang Philip Glass's music for the first time, I was really struck that it has a kind of, uh, in its repetition, something that really speaks to the human brain. I don't know why. And so I wanted to combine that with the great emotion of Handel, and I, and I made this album with Philip Glass and Handel, the Baroque composer. And um, putting their music together, I decided that, okay, it was great, I made an album with an orchestra and beautiful music, but how do I introduce it to people outside of the classical music world? And it began with me wanting to make these classical music videos, like, uh, like they do for pop songs, but in classical music, they're often not very creative. And it wasn't about putting me in them. In fact, I'm only in one of the nine that we made. Right. Rather, it was about putting the music in the hands of an artist, be it uh, someone who makes actual art or a filmmaker, and having them interpret it through their lens. Because somehow, then we can experience the music in a different way. So we worked with all kinds of people like Tilda Swinton and James Ivory or the Russian artists AES plus F um, who made a wonderful video for us, Mark Romanek and Maurizio Catalan, all different kinds of people. And their different take on this classical music was made into these videos. And then those videos were incorporated into a live performance in which I had a 37-piece orchestra, and then I had three different stations through, that, through this huge, huge church where we performed it in New York, and an art museum where we performed it in Philadelphia. And one of them was a dance station where I had a wonderful and famous choreographer, Justin Peck, choreograph ballet dancers, um, and dancers actually from different traditions to the music, one section, there was a painter, George Kondo, a wonderful, famous painter, who painted um, behind a scrim, backlit. So you just saw the front of the painting and you saw the lines evolve throughout the performance. And then the films were projected in another area. And the- Simultaneously, all si three- All simultaneously. And the audience could hear the music wherever they were, but they sat in their chair for the beginning of the show and then, at some point, each member of the audience was picked up with a little contraption that lifted their chair and moved to one of the other stations. And that happened 
three times throughout the performance. And then I asked Raf Simmons, who's a wonderful fashion designer, to um, make costumes for this show, and he made incredible things. So we had a great choreographer, a great painter, filmmakers, and a fashion designer, all working with the music as the thread to sew the different pieces together and to give fans of these famous artists in their own genres access to a music that they might not have otherwise encountered. So it was a way of trying to bring in different crowds, different people into classical music. And that's really what I'm interested in, in addition to performing at opera houses around the world. I want the operas I'm performing to reach new ears. So how many seats, for example, was... Uh, we had 300 people moving and then hundreds more standing and watching. So it was very complicated. Wow. It sounds like an incredibly expensive show. It was very expensive. What was and the budget? It was, production? oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I know like, I, I had to raise half a million dollars just to get it done. Uh -huh. But if you count the fact that these filmmakers, a lot of them donated their, their films. Um, so all of the money that was spent on that, the costumes made by Calvin Klein and designed by Raph Simmons were all donated. So it was millions and millions of dollars worth of work. Here I can see uh, the fragility of your idea, uh, idea of popularization because uh, you don't do collaboration with, uh, I don't know, Frank Ocean or any other uh, superstar. Uh, you do real classic music and you try to popularize it uh, among like broad audience, which was never the case. Uh, like broad audience who, uh, who love pop music would never love uh, real baroque music as much as they do love like Michael Jackson or You don't think uh, so but why? Uh, if you, I asked you why do you think they uh, No no I don't I, I don't think it it no, is No I, I mean I'm curious like uh, honestly if you think that um, there like well I mean I think that's a very valid yeah, assumption I think because uh, I, I think so because um, the previous track record never proved the opposite. Right. Like uh, classical music. But is music there anything for... fundamentally in the music that it's complicated. they wouldn't like as much? Aha, uh -huh, now we're getting to it. It's complicated. Uh, it what else? It is complicated. And um, it's not that um, fun. Right. Like, it's dance. not like... It's not, you can't dance uh, to the Baroque opera, right? You, you can well, only sing it. And it's mostly, it is sad music, right? It's not no. so, so cheerful. So I think that actually, until you experience a lot of this music, you don't know that it's not that complicated. It's just music. So you don't have to know anything about it in order to experience an emotion. But people assume that they have to learn about it in order to appreciate it, but they don't actually. Also, a lot of Baroque music is very upbeat and very fast. I can play you some that almost you could dance to now. It doesn't have like a beat that you're used to in a club, but it's all about what you're familiar with and what makes you. So a lot of times when I'm biking through New York City on my bicycle, I put on some Baroque thing and it f makes me bike faster, just like really? pop music would. Do you run or do you jogging? Yeah, yeah. What do you listen when you're I jogging? often listen to classical music, sometimes Philip Glass, because it's so much fun to be running to Philip Glass music. Uh, can you imagine any bar or discotheque uh, where they dance uh, with uh, like classic music? I think that it's... It's unusual, but it's worth <laughs> trying. It, it's worth trying, but never uh, anyone tried. No. Right? So maybe we should try. <laughs> maybe that's my next thing is the classical music disco. True. It's fun to joke about whether we can dance to classical music. And I think there's something interesting there. But of course, classical music occupies a somewhat different part of our experience. But that doesn't mean it's not something that we want to enjoy. Um, and I think that if we figure out how to make it cool again, essentially, uh, in my experience is that in Europe, it's more a part of the culture than it is in America. So even in Europe, even if it's something you only do every once in a while, you go and if you see something amazing by an amazing director or that's visually very stunning or musically it attracts you, 
then it starts to be cool. The younger people start going. The corporations become interested in funding it because the younger people are going. And then it is something different. We've seen it happen with opera twice wow. in the past hundred years. First with Maria Callas, who was a famous opera singer in the 50s. And she transcended opera. She became on the cover of all these newspapers, magazines, paparazzi. She dated Aristotle Onassis. She was a superstar. And she had so much emotion in her that for that time, she was able to bring opera to a larger audience. The next time it happened was in the 1990s with the three tenors and Pavarotti. And Pavarotti somehow embodied this idea of opera that people could relate to. This big guy with a handkerchief and a beard singing as a tenor. And he went all over the world and became uh, one of the best sellers uh, in the world, not just among classical music, but in the world. And he broke through. But what's interesting to me is I don't think that either of them, if they were alive now and starting now, would be popular in that way. They were both a product of their time. So the question so why not is, now? well, the question is who and how now can break through in that way. And if it's not me, then I at least want to help move the discussion along and create a context in which classical music can be breaking through. Why exactly do you want to popularize uh, opera? Uh, why don't you want it to be like elite uh, kind of art uh, for like very special, uh, rich and very well educated uh, audience with a good taste? That's a really good question. Um, I feel from my own experience that um, opera and in particular deals with these very emotional subjects that we don't encounter very often. Death, loss, love that you have that's very powerful. and. So when they happen in our lives, when someone dies, um, you know, we don't know how to look at it emotionally. We don't know how to relate to it. This music, when we go to the opera and we see that, and we see through an artistic scrim, uh, you know, this incredibly powerful part of life, we understand those important things in a different way. It gives us a, a mode to think about it without being as difficult. Yeah, but uh, hip hop culture or like rap music uh, de is dealing with exactly the same questions of love, uh, death, crime, and so on. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference? What uh, these um, classic baroque music can teach you more uh, than like hip hop music about the same uh, topics? Well, I think it can get to uh, a more emotional place, perhaps, than rap. I think rap um, is fantastic and it can be very engaging. It can be very intellectual almost, um, but it doesn't often make you cry. Do you know what I mean? Or it doesn't often reach into a very deep and primal emotional space that's a little more abstract. I think opera time and classical music time is stretched out and slower, which makes people have, it's difficult to sit and listen to something. But when you do, when you take the time to do it, it can sort of like meditating or, you know, any number of things, having a, a serious long conversation with someone you're in love with, have the effect of reaching a deeper emotional place. Uh, how long was the longest uh, relationship or love story? Uh, probably five years that I had. Um, and all I've had the most important relationships were five years, and then there was a two-year relationship and another two-year relationship. And all three of them are my closest friends. So um, that is good. Before or after you had After, that? after. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yes, so it's nice. That I'm having dinner with the one I had a five-year relationship with tonight. And... Uh, talking on the phone later with another one and, you know, seeing the other one later this week. So I see them all the time and we're in a way like family. And this is something I, I think is less common in straight relationships somehow. Um, I was talking with someone about this recently where often men and women date and they break up and then they just, 
go off on their own way. Uh, but in the relationships I've had, it's not easy. It's not any easier for gay people. But I say, you know, look, we spend all this time together and uh, I know that we're not going to be together in the same way. But we're, I do feel we're a part of each other's family. So I try and... Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, as far as I know, um, uh, people, uh, like straight people, um, break up rare, less often than uh, like gay people. Why, do, uh, why yeah. do you think it's so? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the generalization is about that and whether it's true, but I, I think that um, straight people, uh, there's, a, there's a different sense of, uh, it, at least in the gay male community, um, how quickly they want to move through sexual partners or, you know, um, I feel like sometimes, <laughs> I feel like sometimes gay men want to, they're, they're, they're less, um, I guess also in part, let me t try and articulate it better. They're less encumbered by, um, traditional relationships and monogamy and all of that. So exactly. Um, so what's the point to break up then? If you st uh, can have like open relationships. Exactly. But are you more like po polyamorous or monogamous? Uh, like in my core. In uh, your core. I guess I would like to think I'm monogamous. Um, although <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the reality is. I don't think I'm, I'm polyamorous. I don't think I could have a relationship with several people at once. Um, <laughs> but I do think that I, there's, a, there's a world in which I could have a partner and live with them and have a whole life with them, but uh, have some additional sexual experiences. Just for fun. Yeah. I remember in one of your interviews, you mentioned that uh, maybe you wish, you can't uh, sing Tosca, uh, maybe you wish to do it uh, to raise those money they, uh, they raise with um, singing Tosca. What exactly do you mean? Is it like being a country tenor is less profitable than being other uh, opera singer? Or So as a counter tenor, you're singing obscure repertoire, Baroque or contemporary, because you're singing either stuff written for the castrati or stuff written today for this voice. But the most popular operas, Tosca, La Boheme, Carmen, things like that, don't have any countertenor roles. And so the big opera houses that pay the big money and all of that around the world, um, the Met, La Scala, Covent Garden, they're not going to do very many of the little obscure operas. Whereas if I were a soprano who sang Tosca, I might be able to work much more consistently in big houses. The disadvantage to being a soprano would be that I wouldn't be forced to come up with new ideas and new projects in the same way. I might just have a career uh, traveling and doing Tosca five times a year here and doing one La Boheme and one new interesting thing occasionally. But now as a countertenor, if I want to have an interesting career and I want to create opportunities for myself, I have to constantly be creating things. And that's led me down a path which I'm actually grateful for. So what exactly are you working on right now? Um, I'm about to star in Akhenaten, which is a Philip Glass opera at the Met. Um, and it's the first title role I've had at the Met, which is, I think, the best opera house in the world. And, um, you know, my hometown opera house, New York City. So I'm excited to play this Egyptian pharaoh. And this Egyptian pharaoh that I think by today's standards was queer. Um, uh, Why? Well, um, Akhenaten was famous for being the first monotheist, probably in history. 200 years before Moses, he came up with the idea that there was one God, not many, many, many gods, and that that was probably the sun. And I was talking to an Egyptologist, um, and I said, now you know about Akhenaten, they say he was a hermaphrodite because he, he's sometimes portrayed with breasts or thick lips and hips and things, and people say, was he a hermaphrodite? And she said, I don't think so, he had kids, but, Akhenaten saw the sun as the unification of man and woman. And so he, trying to be closer to the sun and closer to God, which is what he thought the sun was, 
tried potentially to make himself more feminine and exist between these genders. And so we see him portrayed, if you look at the statues of him with almost breasts, as uh, somewhere between man and woman. Um, and so I think in that sense was kind of one of the first people who, by today's lens, I don't know what he would have defined it as in his own time, but by today's lens, we would say queer or, you know.